Um, with regard to the last lecture, I know it was a lot of ground that we covered, but I have to say um, there's um, very important material. So make sure that um, you review it by either re-watching the video or at the very least um, look at all the uh, papers and other resources that I provide in Canvas and on the description of the uh, video uh, on YouTube uh, because all these things are essential to understand how to analyze what your classifier, what your regressor, what your clustering method does, okay? Without those, um, it would be completely lost. Now, given that, I'm going to cover um, in some detail today um, a couple of techniques. Um, one is boosting that we have not seen yet, and the other one is kernel methods that attempt to address um, some of the issues that we discussed in our last lecture. So let's get started with um, boosting. Boosting is part of resampling for classification. There are many methods. Uh, arsing is one of them, uh, bagging, and so on, of which boosting is the most famous one. So for example, in bagging, um, which is uh, called bootstrap aggregation, uh, most generally um, uses subsets of our training data. So if we have n training samples as usual, I will select n prime uh, training samples with n prime smaller, significantly smaller than n. Um, for from our uh, D, D remember it's our um, data matrix. And we do this with replacements, right? So every time that we take n prime samples out, we run the classifier, we implement the classifier, we get a classifier, and then um, we restack the samples back into D, and then we randomly select another set of n prime samples, okay? Um, and then classification is done on a voting, um, voting basis. So here's ba a basic idea of how boosting may work in the most simplistic, obviously, um, uh, design. We randomly select n1 or n prime samples out of n. Uh, let's call this uh, selection, this subset, d sub 1. We train a first classifier, let's call it c1, or a regressor, could be the same thing, but let's focus on classification. We train the first classifier c1 with this uh, d1 data. And now, once we have the C1, we create a second set, D2, where half of the samples uh, in that D2 subset are correctly classified by the classifier, and the other half are incorrectly classified by the classifier, right? And then with that, we train another classifier, C2, uh, which could be the same classification algorithm, by the way, right? Usually it's the same classification algorithm, but you obtain a different classification boundary, right? Um, and then you can do classification based on C1 and C2. Of course, you cannot do voting because if they disagree, then you'd be one and one, so you need the third classifier. So what you do is you create a third subset, D, D sub three, um, from which uh, its samples, uh, N3 samples, are uh, not consistently classified by C1 and C2, right? So you create a classifier C3 that can uh, create, uh, disambiguate, if you will, right? The samples, yep. All right, we're back on. <laughs> so now hopefully everyone can see. Um, so as I was saying, we create the first classifier with D sub one, create the second classifier with D sub two, of which D sub two uh, have half of the samples are correctly classified by C1, and half the samples are incorrectly classified by uh, C1. And then with C1 and C2, if they agree, they correctly classify the sample, right? So we leave it there. But for the samples that are incorrect, or excuse me, the samples are classified as A in, uh, by C1 and as not A by C2, then those we put them in a D3 subset right, of samples, and then we train a third classifier to disambiguate uh, this classification. All right. Um, so here would be an example. 
imagine that you have this um, set of points, the red points and the black points corresponding to class one and class two. And now you use a simple linear classifier, C1, and you find this classification here, right? And that divides the feature space into two regions, region one, region two. And now you apply this classifier here and you extract Samples are correctly classified, samples are incorrectly classified, 50-50, and that you create, with that you create a subset D2, and with that subset D2 that looks like this, right, you find another classifier. And now with these two classifiers, you see where they disagree on the data that you originally had, and you use those points that are classified as one in the first classifier, but as two in the second classifier, right? And you put them here to find a third classification boundary, like this one, and now you do voting, right? So you do for any training sample or testing sample, most importantly, you apply C1, C2, and C3, right? And every time that C1 or CI says class J, then you vote one for class J, right? And then you may end up with either three votes or two votes for the winner, right? The winner class. And that's the same as having a nonlinear classification like this from linear classifiers. See how this works? Okay, now this is the most simplistic case. We're gonna complicate this a little more. But the idea of boosting is that you can actually get very complex, very um, good classifiers from very simplistic classification algorithms. So the point, uh, going back to what we had from last lecture, right, in our no free lines theorem and all the cross-validation and the stability that we mentioned, what the requirement here is, is that each of these classifiers that you use has to be for your particular problem under your, uh, under your assumptions or your hypothesis, right? Um, what, what this classifier has to give you is better than chance classification. But that's it. It could be just a little better than chance. If it's much better than chance, good for you, right? But the requirements are only better than chance. So what is usually called weak classifiers, uh, so you can use very weak classifiers, typically meaning linear classifiers, right, um, to uh, improve that. Now remember this is related also to uh, the VC dimensionality I just alluded to and the stability of a classifier, right? Um, so VC dimensionality, if you remember, is nothing else than that how much, in other words, how much capacity a classifier regressor has. And by this I mean how much can I adapt to a particular problem or how much can I approximate a particular set of functions, right? So that is the same as if I go back to bias and variance, to the bias or to the variance? What do you think? To minimizing the bias or minimizing the variance? The bias, right? Because I want to get as good as a fit as I, I can. I don't care about the variance. What I want is to be as accurate as I can in my estimation of the conservation boundary or the regression function, right? And that means that my classifier, my regressor, has huge capacity, right? It can adapt. For example, it could be a very high degree polynomial function, right? That can adapt to anything you give me, okay? Um, now, uh, this is what I just said. Um, a, a very famous algorithm that is uh, typically used in boosting, it's called Adboost and comes from adaptive boosting. It doesn't come, unfortunately, from other Lovelace. Uh, you will know other Lovelace as the very first programmer in history um, when she worked with uh, Babish when he was working on his uh, engine, uh, his mechanical engine, or first mechanical computer. Um, so anyways, other boost, um, adaptive boosting uh, allows us to keep adding weak classifiers, not just three, but adding weak classifiers to infinitum or until we reach a classification accuracy that we want to. Uh, 
And in this case, it's simple in our data matrix D, it receives a weight factor. Let's call this weight WK for the kth sample. Now at each iteration, we randomly select n prime samples according to that weight. Okay, so here's how it works. This is a training error for the CK classifier on D. So we're going to have a, a variable alpha, alpha K, which is equal to 1 minus the training error given by the CK classifier. So at the beginning, I have C1, right? So I use C1, say I use a support vector machine, or I use uh, linear discriminant analysis, what have you, to find a linear classifier, for example. And then with that, I can compute the training error given by that classifier, right? And now this function, it's going to give me how well I'm doing, right, according to that classifier, right? And I use a logarithmic function here because I want to saturate this value. I don't want this value to keep growing and growing and growing. Otherwise, we're going to have the same problem that we always discuss when we talk about outliers, right? That we exponentially, for example, with x squared, and with the least square or a square loss function, we keep increasing to infinitum. So this is going to be our alpha. And now our weight is going to be the exponential function of this alpha, right? And which means that is proportional to the error function, right? So depending on how well this classifier does on my simple, right, I will give it a, a, a higher or a lower um, uh, uh, weight, right? And this is just a normalizing constant right here that we're adding to make sure that, again, these weights correspond to weights for um, uh, normalized weights for, for the classification. So this is how you design uh, the classifier then. Um, Adabus will focus on the most uh, informative or most difficult patterns, right? By patterns, we mean the uh, samples that we have. For each group of n prime samples, we train a component classifier. We can keep learning until the training error is below a predefined threshold with this approach. And at this stage, I'm going to find a hypothesis. Remember, from my hypothesis space capital H, I'm going to find a hypothesis H sub k right, of x. And I'm going to multiply this H sub k of x by this value right here that tells me how good that particular classifier is on my data, right? So if I have a classifier that is um, really bad for a, specific, um, for a specific task, then I don't want this um, classifier that I have here to have more weight than the classifier that gives me better, right? And that can be for two reasons, either because this H is drawn from a different capital H, right? So the hypothesis space may change over time. Or most typically, because I change the training data, right? By randomly drawing samples from my training samples, OK? And with that, um, I can keep adding classifiers to infinitum, right? As many classifiers as I want every time I weight them. And that allows me to find a, a a very, uh, what's usually called, this usually called the strong classifier, and this usually called the weak classifier, right? So when you combine a lot of weak classifiers, you end up with a strong classifier, right? Is that clear? Any questions? Yeah, question. Um, that's a very good question, um, actually. So does boosting overfit to the data, right? And the short answer is not as much as you would think, because you have a combination of weak classifiers, right, that have a weight attached to it on how well they perform on a specific data sets, right, or sub data sets. Now, if you add enough weak classifiers, right, then the combination of more than one classifier will reduce the overfitting of one classifier versus the overfitting of another classifier. Okay? 
So if one classifier um, overfits in a region of your feature space, right, it goes way deep, right? But you have another set of classifiers that don't. And that one that overfitted in that region of the feature space does not have a really high alpha weight, then you are really not overfitting to that region of the feature space. Okay. Now, could it happen that in some regions that were the case if you don't have enough classifiers, or that alpha for some reason was very high? It could happen, but it's not typically the case. Okay. More questions? Um, so um, here's a, another extension of, of what I've said of uh, the ensemble test error. Um, but let me turn, most importantly, to, I think, another um, extension of this algorithm, the boost, that is used for feature selection. And then remember from a feature selection, it's different than feature extraction. Feature, feature extraction is when we try to find a linear or nonlinear combination of the original features that we have that represent our data, right? So uh, if you use correlations to find this linear combination, uh, we talk about PCA. If you use um, nonlinear correlations, uh, then we talk about ICA and so on, right? Remember? Feature selection means that of the original features, you select a certain number of them, right? You don't go for the linear or nonlinear combination of them, you just go for a subset of these features. Um, and the thing is that the same ideas that we have defined here for add the boost can be applied to, uh, to feature selection. Um, this is applicable, what I'm going to describe, only to the two-class problem, as um, we have been doing for several lectures now. Um, and the basic idea is that at each iteration i, uh, we will select the feature fi that's associated to the smallest classification error, right? So the basic idea is very simple. Let's see the algorithm. Um, we start by initializing our variables, our weights. So at the very beginning, Samples in class one uh, say that I have m samples in class one, and samples in class two means the number of samples in class two, right? So I'm going to initialize my weights to one, one half, uh, or one over two m, and one over two l. And this is the variable that is going to indicate where I'm at, right? In which of the classes I'm at. And now I'm going to iterate. First, I'm going to normalize the weights to make sure, again, that the weights are properly normalized and they add up to one and so on and so forth, as we usually do. Um, then we're going to train the classifier xj uh, for each of the p features that I have right, in our, say, real domain of p dimensions. And then I'm going to calculate this error function. right? And the error function is how well my classifier xj hj, excuse me, uh, for the simple xi, is uh, how close this is to the true underlying unknown, or well, in that case, for the training data is known, right? For the, for the true known in the training data um, outcome, right? Output or uh, class. So obviously, if my classifier classifies the simple correctly, yi is going to be equal to this function, right? And if not, it's going to be different, and therefore this is going to be a larger than zero, and therefore I'm going to have an error that I'm going to add here. And I'm going to multiply this by the weight because obviously at the very beginning all the samples have the exact same weight, right? All the samples are equally important. You agree? Now what I'm going to do next is to actually change the weights. What I'm going to do, I'm going to change the weight according to how well these samples are classified by the current classifier, right? So if the weights are correctly classified by the current classifier, I'm fine. But if they are not correctly classified, then I need to change, right? So I'm going to make this uh, isapi uh, variable equal to 0 if xi is successfully classified. Now let's go back here. If this is 0, right, this is beta to the 1, right? You see that? But if, um, but if the xi is not correctly classified, then I make this equal to 1, and then this is uh, 1 minus 1, right? 0. Okay? So I just leave this as is. I don't change the weight. 
And how am I going to change the weight? Well, I'm going to define this p function that is e sub i over 1 minus e sub i, right? So again, if the, sub, if the um, simple is successfully classified, this is going to be 0, right? But if it's incorrectly classified, this is going to be infinite, right? Okay? So you keep increasing with a function, right? I mean, in reality, in practice, it cannot be infinite, but a large number, right? You keep increasing the weight at each iteration of the samples that you have problems classifying. And you decrease the weight of the samples that you correctly classify. Make sense? Right? And you keep iterating this, right? You keep iterating all this process, changing the weight. You normalize the weight at each state, obviously. Uh, and you keep repeating this, and you keep finding classifiers, right? that keep getting you better and better and better and better at the samples that you are unable to classify correctly. And if you happen to add, note that if you happen to add a classifier that now incorrectly classifies a previously correct classified sample, you change the weights of that sample again, right? And you keep repeating that. And at the end, you build this strong classifier as we've done before, right? By multiplying the alphas, which are given by this, um, times the weak classifiers. Um, so with this, what, what you do, right, um, it, this is going to give you which are the, uh, the dimensions or the classifiers that best separate your data, right? So let me, um, th this was made famous by this application, so let me walk you through very quickly through a very simple application. It's uh, in phase detection. Um, so you can do convolutions of these uh, filters. Now if you take taken image processing and or computer vision with me, you know how to compute the convolution of a linear filter. Um, these are approximations of Gabor filters. And basically, uh, you place these filters at all the possible locations in the image, and that defines your features, OK? And then you use this other boost algorithm that I just described to extract which are of the features that uh, are most descriptive of a face versus a not a face. And then you can use that for classification. So here's how you, you build the classifier. First, you build a classifier that learns to distinguish possible faces and not faces. Okay. Now, what are you going to do? You're going to use a classifier or set of classifiers that correctly eliminates the non-face class. Okay. And here, in T, you're going to have all the faces, plus quite a bit of non-faces, OK? And now you go to the second classifier. And remember, this has faces and non-faces. You're going to try to extract most of the faces and maybe some non-faces, and a lot of non-faces out, right? And you keep repeating this until you eliminate all the non-faces, and you end up only with faces, all right? So you can keep adding classifiers until the system uh, gives you what you need. Um, that was, in the early 2000s, um, the very first algorithm not only that could detect faces. We already had algorithms in the 90s that could detect faces really well in images. But that worked uh, about the same, if not a little better, than other algorithms, but it works really fast. right? So you could implement this in a very tiny cheap. And when this algorithm came, uh, variations of this algorithm were the very first algorithms that were implemented in uh, photo cameras, right? Not in cell phones at that time yet, but in photo cameras, the first photo cameras that could detect faces um, in, in the image in real time, that was thanks, thanks to Adaboost. Okay. Um, so here are some examples of the original paper of this algorithm detecting some faces. And at that point, you know, you couldn't still detect certain faces that were either partially occluded or too rotated, or obviously, by now, the algorithms that we have can detect faces that are um, in basically almost any condition. Not all of them, obviously, but most of them. Right? Any questions before I move on about boosting? There are many variants of boosting. I only have time, obviously, to cover some of the fundamentals here, but as always, I'll put more information in Canvas. Okay. Yeah, question then. 
the features that you use are uh, dependent on the problem. So if you work in computer vision, right, and then if you take my image processing, my computer vision class, especially the computer vision class, in computer vision we spend at least half of the course defining what features might be useful, right, for specific problems within computer vision. If you take uh, courses that we teach here at Ohio State uh, on speech analysis, then they're going to teach you what are the features that are relevant for speech, right? If you take courses in bioinformatics that we also have, they're going to teach you what are the features that are important to describe the genetics, uh, the SNPs, the what have you in, uh, in biology, right? And so on and so forth. So the features are extremely dependent on the problem. Now, once we cover uh, deep learning, we're going to briefly talk about deep features. And the, the, the thing is that you can um, extract the features um, in, within the system, within the same classifier. Um, it's basically a way of uh, finding uh, metrics or kernel mappings that give you a certain number of abstract features that you have never come up with but that are useful for that particular network, deep network, uh, to do a chief classification. Um, so actually, deep networks are very interesting. Deep networks originally were not used for classification, um, but they were mostly used. I mean, they were used for classification, but they were mostly used to find features in feature spaces. So people would train a deep network, right? And the deep network would find, and we'll see how, these so-called deep features. And from that, you would achieve some classification. But then what people used to do is they would chop out the classifier in the deep network, and then they would get this feature space that the network had found and plug it in into an SVM or whatever other classifier into a boosting. Um, and that worked really well. Mm -hmm. Other questions? All right. So. With that, uh, let me go back to kernel methods. And basically, we are just going to spend most of our time from now on talking about kernels. Um, obviously, we're going to do a lot of, um, we're going to talk a lot about uh, deep networks, but we'll see why um, kernels can actually lead um, to, or kernel mappings can lead to the de definition of neural networks. All right. so. Remember a kernel space. The kernel space is that intrinsic space that I defined with the kernel matrix, right? The kernel mapping, um, this uh, functional mapping that I defined, phi, for example, right? That maps from my original space to some theoretically infinite dimensional space, right? F, but that we're not really doing that mapping phi, but instead we're changing the metric in the original space, right? such that it's equivalent to uh, converting a linear classifier into a nonlinear classifier. All right. So um, this approach um, can be applied, as we saw, to, say, support vector machines, to discriminant analysis, and so on. It can also be applied to regression, which we didn't cover in detail. But um, briefly, we did talk about kernel-rich regression, remember? Um, obviously, a very famous approach. Um, there is another approach, which is an extension or a, a reformulation of support vector machines, but for regression, which is called support vector regression, and then its kernel version, it's called kernel support vector regression. Okay, it can also be applied to graph matching. Um, it can do uh, graph matching, and the reason is because kernels represent nothing than the metric, right? I just said that. Um, so let's see a few examples of those today. And then we'll see how this extends to designing um, deep networks, OK? All right? OK. So let me do graph matching first. Um, so remember, graphs, right? When I have graphs, graphs are nothing else than a certain number of nodes and edges, right? Things like that. You see this? Now. Imagine that you have a certain number of graphs that represent the same thing, the same category, right? They can represent, for example, a, a spoken word, right? So 
This could be the phonemes um, in graph. Typically, words are described by phonemes, right? The indivisible components of the sound of the word, and then the connections between them specify in which way you can combine these phonemes to create a word, right? And so on and so forth. So that would be one possibility. Uh, another possibility would be in computer vision. For example, you want to define actions, right? Um, and an action involves more than one frame, uh, which means that you need to represent for each node different uh, parameters of each frame and how these uh, parameters evolve over time to define an action, right? Um, it could be using communications as well, right? To define some communication signal or some security of that communication signal across time and so on. So, okay, you have a, a set, um, let's call it a training uh, set of graphs, and some of, these set, uh, some of these samples correspond to, say, class one, and some of these samples to class two, as typical. And now with this, we want to map this, right, to create a feature space where each graph corresponds to a simple feature vector in our, um, in our feature space. And that feature, simple feature vector corresponds to a graph, right? An individual graph. And with that, then we can build a classifier, right? Linear, nonlinear classification in that space. And then once we have a test graph, we project it into here. It'll correspond to another feature vector, right? And then with this classifier, we can know whether it belongs to class one or class two. So far, so good? So how are we going to do that? Um, okay, I'm going to give you, uh, there are many algorithms to achieve that, right? I'm just going to give you one um, briefly here. So I'm going to describe one um, that uses what's called directed labeled graphs. And the, I want to do that because this is a type of graph that we have not seen yet, okay? Now, a directed graph, you know what it is. A node here, a node there, and a directed edge. That points me in what direction I can go. I cannot go in the other direction, just one direction, right? Labeled, uh, or, or let me go back, uh, a weighted directed graph, if you remember, is that these edges have a weight in them, right? A labeled graph has labels, meaning semantic labels, rather than weights, rather than numerical values. Okay, um, so for example, um, labels that you can use are predicates, right? Predicates specify some temporal information, but they specify uh, a temporal information in a qualitative manner rather than a quantitative manner, right? A weight will give you a quantitative value. Here you give a qualitative value. So for example, predicates are famous. These are first order predicates. Um, action or element uh, one, happens before element two. And before means before, right? It's not, there is no quantitative measure how long uh, ago or how much time there has to happen between one element and the other. It's just before. Um, meets means that when one finishes, immediately at this instant, the other one starts, right? Um, equals means that they both start and end at the same time. During means that the second happens during the first one. Um, stars means that they start at the same time but end at different times. Uh, finishes or ends means that they end at the same time but they started at different times, right? Um, this, these are so called first order predicates. These are all the first order predicates that you need to describe all the qualitative temporal relationships between two elements, okay? Now, there are many other things that, could, that you could define. For example, after. But after is the same as before, because A happening after B is the same that B happening before A, right? So there's an equivalence uh, with that. So these predicates are sufficient. So a directed label graph, it's a four tuple, let's call it G, um, with V the vertices or nodes, E the edges, L the labels that we're going to use, and F is a mapping function. So let's look at this. These are my nodes defined here. These are my edges, right? So the edge from node one to node two, one to three, and so on all the way to one through two, the last one, and the previous to last to last one, right? 
all the edges. And L, it's the list of all these possible labels or some other labels that you may want to use. And F is a function that maps your nodes and edges onto L. Okay? Now, what we're going to do, now remember that we want to do, now we have these directed labeled graphs here, but we want to represent them in some feature space, right? A classical way to do that in graphs is by defining the paths that you find within a, path, within a graph, right? So when I have a specific graph, there is a, put, a possible path that goes through the existing edges. If the edge doesn't exist, then I cannot go through that path, right? Remember that we covered all this back when we were in the lectures when we were uh, discussing graphs. Um, so a path will be nothing else than, okay, let's say for example, I start at node one, and then I, there is an edge from one to two, so I move to node two, and there's an edge from two to three, so I move to three, and so on, right? So that's a path. Um, with, when you have labels, right, you have this function that you have to apply to the nodes, right? Because applying this function, remember, to the node is going to give you the label that you have, right? All right. So a simple graph, G sub K, let's say, can now be defined as a feature vector, XK, with each entry in XK specifying the number of times that a path P, say a path like this, occurs in GK, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to see which path exists in my graph, and I'm going to count how many times each of these paths occurs. And that I'm going to define it in a feature vector, X sub K, right? And now I have a way to represent graphs in a feature space. So, yeah, question. F what? Uh, F, F it's a function that allows you from this union to know which label you have. You may have the labels in the nodes, in the edges, or in both, right? So here I'm just putting the, um, the equation for both of them. If you only have the labels in one, then you only need to apply to one of them, right? So for example, the node could represent, could be given by a label, so um, uh, say um, that you're representing, I'll give you an example later on where you're representing the human body, right? And the first node could be the lower section of the right leg, right? And that could be a label. And the other node could be the upper section of the right leg, right? And so on. Things like that. Make sense? All right. So, um, let PBZ uh, be the path of length Z, okay? Z has to be larger or equal than zero. If it's zero, then I'm just staying at one node, right? So Z equal to zero means all the paths that have just one node. So um, those, already, uh, those obviously exist. And B is one through RZ, where RZ is the total number of paths of this length in the set of all possible graphs that I can have, okay? And with that, you can construct this uh, feature vector. And this feature vector, each entry, specifies the number of times that a path, PBZ, occurs in G. See how this works? Yep. And W is the, let's say it's the longest path, and therefore, um, where you're going to have, it's Z goes from 0 to W, right? If W is the longest possible path. Okay. Now, we're assuming here that you don't have clicks in the graph. Remember clicks? Because if you have clicks and you can go back to, um, to some point, then you can get into issues, right? So assume that that's not occurred. Now, what do we want to do? We want to measure how similar two feature vectors to different paths are. And how are we going to define this? We're going to define it with a kernel. What's a kernel? It's a metric given by an inner product, meaning 
a kernel defines a Hilbert space, right? So we have this kernel matrix right, between two graphs. So I have two graphs, GK1, GK2. I want to know how similar these two graphs are. Do they correspond to the same thing or to different things, right? Now remember, I need this similarity matrix to implement uh, support vector machines, to implement linear discriminant analysis, to use uh, subclass discriminant analysis. Anything that I want to, I need to define a metric, right? That's how I measure similarity in my algorithm. And that's a metric I'm going to use for um, two different graphs. They, I'm going to do an inner product of their inner products, okay? And that's equal to this equation that you have here, which corresponds to this nice equation right here, which means which is the kernel of all the path of lengths z, z0 to w. Remember, w is the longest path we can find of the two graphs, right? Now, this is my kernel. The problem with that kernel, obviously, with that metric, is that it's super computationally expensive. Right? I mean, can you imagine? You have to find all the paths and then compute all this. So um, I'm not going to go through details because it's, it would take us too long here, but I've given you here the derivations of how this is done. And as always in Canvas, you have the paper um, with the details. But basically, it is shown in the paper that this equation right here simplifies to this nice equation right here, where this equation uh, has this indica indicator function uh, gamma, that's either one or zero when these two nodes exist in the two graphs, okay? In the two paths, excuse me, of the graphs, okay? So basically, if two nodes exist in the path for graph one and it exists in the path of graph two, then the indicator function says yes, and if they don't, it says no, right? And then you can just add up all these indicator functions, and this is going to give you the same value than this. And this can be computed like that, right? Super fast. Um, here's an example of this um, in American Sign Language to model sign languages. Um, so, for example, you can model, you know, labels here of right hand shape A. This is specifically hand shaped shape used in American Sign Language uh, equals one of those predicates, the uh, left hand shape, uh, hand shape A, and so on, right? So let's see how this works. Uh, here's another example uh, for um, action recognition in computer vision. So you detect the 3D body pose uh, using computer vision algorithms that I described in the class, uh, computer vision. And then once you have this, you describe this pose and the movement of these different elements with a graph like this. You have a training set, and then you want to distinguish, I don't know, uh, class one when the soccer player is, uh, I don't know, kicking the ball versus when it's running with the ball, right? And then you find a nonlinear classifier with using that kernel, which um, obviously, remember, um, I can always change this by using a phi function here, right? And making it um, as complicated as I want. And then with that metric that I have, I can use a linear classifier to find nonlinear classification boundary, right? And their classification. All right, another thing I want to cover is uh, kernel, mat metric, uh, kernel matrices, uh, or um, kernel mappings, rather, for uh, subclass schema analysis and before I use the slides let me go to the board for a second so I think that this is something important um, to understand, uh, at least to understand the equations, because this is in, at the essence of the type of equations that you're going to be using when you use kernel mappings. Okay, so this is kernel methods in discriminant analysis. Now recall that discriminant analysis is nothing else 
we covered this in quite detail. Um, this scheme analysis is nothing else than the maximization, right? Our goal is to maximize the criterion, right? Or to find the W, rather, I should say, right? The goal is to find W that maximizes this criterion, which is, anyone remembers? Okay, so you want to find the projection of a metric, a symmetric positive definite or semi-definite metric that defines a metric, uh, excuse me, matrix that defines a metric, right? Um, the one that when projected onto W is maximized and this one that is minimized, right? So um, for example, in LDA, right? The most simple, the simplest one that we derived, A was equal to um, mu one minus mu two times mu one minus mu two transpose, right? right? And maybe you want to have a normalizing factor here or not. And then B is equal to the summing over I is going to be, say, in the two class, let's say in the two class LDA problem, right, to simplify things. Um, so I'm going to say I from 1 to 2, J from 1 to NI, where NI is the number of simples in class I. And now I can have the simple from class I, so the J simple of class I minus mu I times XI j minus mu i transpose, right? Correct? And obviously these are the means, right? So my mu i's are given by one over n i, the sum over all i of x i j, right? We know that. So our, what we want to do now is we want to extend to change j onto the nonlinear case, right? We want to do that in a kernel space. This is in the original feature space. Now we want to go to the kernel space, right? Now, how are we going to do that? We're going to use a mapping function, right? So you're going to use a kernel mapping function. Let's say phi, right? Um, and that is going to give us the new criterion to be maximized, right? We want to find the W that maximizes this new criterion. Maybe I can call it uh, J phi. How about that? Uh, to distinguish it from the first one of W transpose A phi W, W transpose B phi W, right? So now A and B are defining this new kernel of space. Okay, and by kernel of space, I mean when I change the metric given by that kernel, right? I'm in a different space, right? It's the same space with a different metric, obviously. All right, so phi here, this phi is obviously given in some, you know, it's part of some uh, space F. And now, this W obviously also has to come from that space, right? Um, so I want to find the, the W that maximizes this new function, right? But W has to be in my space. And now, what is A phi? A phi is nothing else than, say, in the simple two-class LDA problem it's going to be equal to the same equation that I have here, right? The same equation. So I'm going to write mu1 minus mu2 times mu1 minus mu2 transpose. But now, this means have to be defined in the new space given by phi, OK? And to do that, 
I'm going to do mu i is equal to 1 over n i, the sum from 1 to n i. Same thing that I had here, but now anyone can help me? Anyone can give me? What do I need to write here? Very good. Phi of x i j, right? Exactly. Okay. So that's what defines a phi, and the same applies to b phi, right? In that case, I'm going to have two summing terms over all i and j, i1 through 2, and j1 through ni. And let's see, I'm going to have phi of xij minus mu i phi times phi xij minus mu i phi transpose, right? Okay, you see that? Now, what do we say? I said something super important right here. W must be in my space, right? It makes sense, but must be in my space. What did we say when we did the derivations of the kernel of space and the gram matrix? What did we say about any vector in my space? That any vector can be defined as a linear combination of what? Of the simples. Very good. Excellent. Um, so W can be defined as phi i. Remember those phi i's that we derived? Um, um, excuse phi i's, these alpha i's that we derived when we derived the gram matrix um, xi, right? Where xi's are our simples. Very good, very good. So what that means, right, hence, as we derived, I'm not doing anything different than what you have in your slides from the previous lecture, right, on kernels. Um, then I have that W transpose mu i phi is going to be equal to 1 over n i summing over i and j. Well, actually, I need to change notation. Um, uh, let's say j and k of alpha j, right, because this is only for i now, and for i, j and k here, alpha j, right, that specifies the weight. What else do I have? Um, now, k of xj and xk, right, this, remember, is the kernel, right, that we derived, right? The linear kernel would be xj transpose xk, right? And any other kernel would be whatever nonlinear function uh, we want. And that is the same as, say, alpha transpose mi, <coughs> um, where our kernel is given by our mapping function phi x transpose phi y, right? And this matrix mi that I have here is, can you can see that? Let me write this down here. mi, um, mij, let's say, the ith chase entry of my matrix m is going to be equal to 1 over ni, the sum over all k from 1 to ni, right, of k xj xik, okay? Yep. You see that? Again, this is just applying the same derivations that we already had, right? but now using them to compute the um, new matrices A phi and B phi, right? And why is that important? Let's see, um, because now 
I can thus, I can write that W transpose AW is equal to alpha transpose M alpha, right? This M that I just derived, right? Where was I? Here, right? I have this thing here, right? So I have W transpose this is equal to this. Now this is corresponding to this. You see that? And W transpose BW should be equal to alpha, let's say another matrix N alpha. And what's this matrix N? This is going to be equal, if we do the derivations, to the sum over all J of, um, let's see, K. This is capital K. Let me probably write it like this. Capital K sub J of I minus 1 N J times capital K J transpose, where this capital K is called the kernel matrix now, um, is um, N by N J, okay? With, we can say that it's um, M, let's say that M nth entry of that matrix, it's equal to the kernel mapping K, our function, of x n uh, with x j, uh, j m. <laughs> okay? You see how this works? That the m nth entry of that matrix, right? m row, nth column, um, is for the j uh, jth kernel matrix, right? Is equal to the inner product, right, of that phi xn transpose phi xjm. Now, don't be confused, right? Remember, these xi's are all my training samples, right? And this corresponds to the nth training sample of the jth class, which obviously is going to be one of those as well, right? OK. Uh, and uh, this, obviously, i is the identity matrix. And this 1 and j is a matrix with all entries equal to 1 over nj. And if we put everything together, right, so finally, we can get our result. We put everything together. Our criterion for, not W, now for alpha, is going to be equal to what I have here, alpha transpose M alpha over alpha transpose N alpha, right? And what is spectacular about this, what is very nice about this, is that we know how to solve this. This is an eigenvalue decomposition problem, generalized eigenvalue decomposition problem, correct? And that is the same as solving for a linear classifier, but obtaining a nonlinear classifier because M and N represent a change in metric, right? It's beautiful, isn't it? So if the exact same algorithms that we already know and have we can now derive following the same derivations, but for any other criterion that we have explained in class, um, you can derive nonlinear classifiers. It's super powerful. Um, kernels uh, are fantastic. So let me um, very briefly describe um, one of this results, and maybe you can do this at home today um, to check that you know how to do these derivations, and then check the papers that I posted in, in Carmen to make sure that you did the right thing. <laughs>
And I'm just going to give you the result. And again, try at home to redo these derivations for, uh, I'm going to do subclass discriminant analysis, which is obviously a much better algorithm than linear discriminant analysis. Um, and that's going to give us kernel subclass discriminant analysis, right? or KSDA for short. OK. And now, again, um, here what we need to remember that in subclass discriminant analysis, our goal was to maximize the between Classes scatter, subclass scatter matrix, right? Right. So that was instead of S B here, we had sigma B, right? W, and then maybe here you can use the covariance matrix or something that corresponds to the within class scatter. And now what we want is to find the kernel version of this matrix, right? So let me start with, well, let me just do this one because the other one is trivial. Obviously, you already know how to do it because I just did it, right, uh, a second ago. So um, the, remember, this is the uh, between subclass this um, uh, scatter matrix, excuse me. OK, so this is going to be equal if the durations are a little lo longer than the ones I had here, obviously, because it's a larger matrix. It has three summing terms. It goes from 1 to C minus 1. C is the number of, of classes. Uh, and then I have J from 1 to HI, right? HI, the number of subclasses in class I. And then there you use K. Yeah, K from I plus 1 to C and L from 1 to hk. And what I'm going to have here, I'm going to leave some space. Know that. I'm going to have the kernel matrix, capital K, for the jth class, excuse me, the jth subclass of the ith class. Now remember, before we only had capital Ki, because we only had classes. Now we have subclasses, right? So we have ij times that matrix of all entries equal to 1 over nj. Um, in that case, it would be ij minus the kernel matrix of kl minus 1 kl. And times the same thing, right? This is the exact same thing transpose. And now I need to multiply this by the normalizing factors, which are the same as the priors, right? right? If all the priors are the same, then it's 1 over the number of subclasses, right? Or number of samples or whatever. Um, so Pij for the jth class of, uh, subclass of the class I, and Pkl for the lth subclass of the class K, right? And that's it. This is the equation. It's that simple. All right, one more question, final, final thing. Um, the, the final thing that we need to solve now that we have, where is it? We have this solution, right, for linear discriminant analysis, this one right here. <laughs> 
and we have this other solution, right, that we can derive for KSDA, right? And now the next question that we need to address is, um, or that you should at least be asking yourself is, this is really nice, Alish, right? I mean, this is really cool. We can build really cool classifiers. But um, how do I optimize my kernel mapping? How do I define my kernel mapping, right? Now, your kernel mapping can be any function you want. It could be logistic regression. Uh, it could be, uh, right, the sigmoidal. It could be uh, the exponential function, the radial basis function, the exponential function that we derived, uh, and so on. Um, but um, all these functions have parameters in them, right? And how do I optimize the parameters? Well, let's think about this. This is actually easier than it sounds. Because in discriminant analysis, what criterion, well, in general, actually, in classification in general, what criterion do I want to use in my optimization? Because remember, Optimal means nothing unless you have a criterion, right? So optimal with respect to what criterion? What criterion would you like to use? If you could choose, which criterion would you choose? Oh, come on. At least you got this from this class. If you have to choose a criterion, which one is going to be? The what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and which criterion gives you that? Which criterion gives you the smallest possible error? Base, right? Right? Okay. So I want to use the base criterion. Now, for discriminant analysis or any other classifier, right, linear classifier, I should say, can we compute the base, uh, or actually scratch everything I just said. Uh, can we in general compute the base classifier? Right, the base classifier is the classifier that I obtain using the base criterion, right? Can I generally compute the base classifier? No. Why not? Because it leads to very complicated nonlinear functions, right? They're not even computable. Okay, but there is one particular case for which this classifier is computable. Which one? Uh, more specific than that. Yes? Homosodastic Gaussians, exactly, exactly. So if I have homosodastic Gaussians, Right? Then I know that this classifier is linear. Right? So, in other words, if I have a feature space here, right? And I have two distributions that correspond to two different classes. And these two distributions have different means, right, so mu1 and mu2 are different from one another, but their covariance matrices are the same, then I know that this problem is linearly separable, right, that there is a linear classifier that gives me the smallest possible classification error. Right? That's what's so powerful about linear discriminant analysis and subclass discriminant analysis and the like. Right? If your assumptions hold, meaning in LDA or, yeah, well, let's start with LDA. With LDA that you have each class represented by a single Gaussian, right? and that all the covariance matrices are the same, right? then you know you're going to get the smallest possible error possible in your feature space, period. It's the best way you're ever going to be able to design. It's great. 
Um, now, obviously, the chances that your assumptions hold are nil because your data is not going to be Gaussianly distributed, let alone by a single Gaussian. But subclass discriminant analysis allows you to define the underlying distribution with a mixture of Gaussians, right? So now if I have a mixture of Gaussians, the chance that I can represent this, uh, this underlying distribution of my data is, have increased tremendously, right? But I still have to have homostatistic Gaussians. Ah, okay. How am I going to find this homostatistic? How am I going to guarantee? How can I try to guarantee that my subclasses are homostatistic Gaussians? Well, here's where the kernel comes in, right? I want to find a kernel mapping, a mapping function phi, that when I map my original data onto my kernel space, the new distributions of my data in that kernel of space are homostatistic Gaussians, right? So that's our goal. So let's see how we can do this. We need to define a criterion. Define a criterion that when maximize or minimize, right? You could come up with either criterion that you maximize or minimize, then when maximize, um, it, uh, uh, it uh, yields kernel spaces, or a kernel of space, rather, where the underlying distributions of your classes or subclasses are homostatistic Gaussians. Now, for um, homostatistic for Gaussian distributions, this criterion is simply given by computing the trace of sigma i, sigma j, right? The distribution of class i, distribution of class j, or subclass i, subclass j, divided by the trace of sigma i plus the trace of sigma j, okay? Now, because, uh, excuse me, squared, that should be squared, this tube down here. Um, but now, we want to do that in the kernel of space, right? So we're going to add our phi here to represent that these are the matrices that we compute in the kernel of space. And now we want to modify the parameters of this function, right? This function is going to have a certain number of parameters. And we want to optimize or change these parameters, right, with a gradient descent, for example, such that this criterion is maximized, okay? So let me show you this. So, um, is it coming up? There he is. So, um, so this is this criterion that I've given here, properly normalized, okay, with the number of classes. Now, when this criterion, and this is something you can implement again uh, today at home in MATLAB, it takes like five minutes to implement this criterion, right? Now, when the Gaussians, two Gaussians, are homocedastic, right, meaning that these two lines that are define the first eigenvector, right? and therefore the first eigenvalue. The first eigenvector, meaning the largest eigenvalue, I mean, right? The first eigenvector of these two distributions are parallel to one another, right? The second eigenvectors are also, and so on and so forth, right? Okay, so that this angle, I'm gonna call it zero because they are parallel. But these ones that deviate from Gaussian, uh, from homostaticity, you see that there is a separation, right? Remember the spherical homostatistic concept that we defined, right? 
the more that you rotate that Gaussian, right, that defines this angle here, right, the more you deviate from homocytosticity. And this function here gives you this sigmoidal looking uh, function here, or inverse sigmoidal, um, where the maximum is given when the angle, shown here in the x-axis, is zero, and the minimum is given when it's 90 degrees, right? Now note that after 90 degrees, it's a mirror image of this one, right? I go back to closer and closer to homocytastic until when the distribution would be here, right? Or be homocytastic again, right? You see that? Okay, so maximizing this gives you a kernel of space where the distributions are homocytastic, Gaussian, homocytastic, uh, homocytastic Gaussian, rather, and that guarantees that you get closer to the optimal base classifier that we so desire to get to, right? So these algorithms work extremely well. This is an application to the phase detection that I've been mentioning several times in the lectures. Um, now this is uh, data points, it's fiducial points. Now we're going from just detecting the phase to detecting a number of fiducial points on the phase, right? Not just the phase itself, not just giving a bounding box on the face by detecting the corners of the eyes and the center of the eyes and the corners of the mouth and all these points that you see here. So all these points can now be detected with the algorithms I defined in the earlier lectures, but instead of using the simplistic methods that I defined earlier with this new method called kernel subclass discriminant analysis. Once you have this, on top of that, you can define these uh, points using a graph as we have been doing uh, here in class as well. And now these graphs gives you the relationship between any pair of points, right? The similarity. Remember that we discussed the similarity that when we described uh, the Laplacian matrix, that you can have an exponential function of the distance of these uh, two nodes, right? Of every two nodes. And with that, you can learn the relationship of these different points which allows you to improve accuracy by adding this as priors into your equations. So the priors that I've been describing here can actually be given by this graph, right? So if I move, say, the, uh, this, this eyebrow, right, the right eyebrow, I move it up, right? This point and that point, right, these two landmark points on my eyebrow, are highly correlated with one another. When I move one up, the other one mo moves up, right? So this is what these prior probabilities, these edges in these graphs that correspond to prior probabilities are going to represent. And combining KSE with this idea, you can get detections of fiducial points on faces like this. This is extraordinary. I mean, every time I look at this, I remember I've been working on this for a long time and the first time that we were able to do something like this was to me mind boggling, right? When I was a grad student, right, in your shoes, um, we could barely detect faces, let alone <laughs> a detailed detection like this, right? Um, note, for example, this point right here, see this fiducial point? The algorithm sees that this corner of the, of the lips uh, are pointing down. It's actually in the correct location. The, uh, this is extraordinary to me. Um, it's robust to open mouth, to any expression that you can create, right? Uh, fascinating. Um, this algorithm, KSDA, has also been applied, for example, to many things, but for example, to automatic detection of action units. Action units are the different uh, movements that you see when you move uh, the facial muscles that are under our skin. So for example, this one here is called action unit two, uh, actually action unit one, excuse me which is the inner corner of the eyebrows moving up, and there is a frontalis muscle, this muscle that you see here, that when, contract, when it contracts, it moves the skin uh, around this area up, upwards, right? And action unit, I think this is, uh, maybe that should be, I don't know if this represents, it's not 12, so that's probably 20. I think that's 20, that's represent, oh yeah, I see. It should be 20, which is this is stretch. Right? It's a muscle here that stretches the mouth in this direction, okay, the corners of the mouth. And now the point is 
that these action units occur in a variety of expressions, right? So action unit one occurs in this, in this expression, but also occurs in this expression or in that expression. You can see that the texture that we actually perceived in the image is very different when that action unit is used in this expression versus when it's used in that other expression, when it's used in that other expression, right? And the same is true for action unit 20, right? You see that? And how are you going to represent this, this variability? Well, you can represent it with subclasses, right? So each subclass can represent one of these variabilities. You can even have subclasses of these subclasses that represent the intensity of activation. Uh, and so on. you can go on and on like this forever. You can use KSDA to optimize the parameters of the kernel. And I'm just going to show you an example of how this works in real time uh, today in, an, in a computer. This is an automatic annotation of which action unit, which underlying facial muscle is being activated on a face. Find this stunning. <laughs> Uh, so AU6 is um, the corner of the, uh, of the uh, eyelids here because of a muscle that moves up. AU12 is a classic of a smile. Um, you see 25, it's open mouth. 26 was to drop. 9 that you see here is the wrinkle of the nose. Um, Anyways, uh, these algorithms now work really, really well. I mean, they, you can do amazing things with these nonlinear classifiers. And the beauty about this is that because you can apply linear classification methods to obtain the result of a nonlinear classifier, right, uh, you can do these things very efficiently uh, with lots of data. And at the end of the day, it can work in real time in a very easy computer. Um, I, I've actually seen this algorithm that you saw here. I've seen it work on a, on a Raspberry Pi. That's how little amount of computations are required <laughs> uh, to make this algorithm work. It's uh, fascinating work. Um, I've added some. Um, oh, actually, let me t briefly talk about this. Do you have time? Yeah, I do. OK. Um, oh, I don't, do I? Uh, all right, OK. Um, I, I want to talk about um, a couple of things on how to evaluate these things that we didn't have time to cover uh, this. So I'll do this very quickly um, before our um, next topic, which is deep learning. All right, I'll see you next week. <laughs>